event, or part of a week of events on Black August. Um, I go by the name Two Black. I am a poet, artist, organizer, and author here in the city and uh, throughout the country. Um, so I'm just here to present um, some basic facts and we're going to get to our keynote of the day by a investor, and he's going to be very interactive with you. Uh, so this is part of a, um, again, part of a week of events on Black August, and I represent the uh, Defense Committee to Free the Pendleton II. Um, we'll get to the Pendleton II more specifically later, but in general, uh, the Pendleton II um, is uh, Naeem Trotter and um, John C. John Ballon Cole. Um, they are two political prisoners here in Indiana who uh, were imprisoned in a um, prison rebellion in 1985 where they tried to save the life of someone and they were sentenced to 84 and 142 years. No one died, um, but that's what happened. So we'll get some more details on that, um, but that's the committee that we represent. So we're trying to bring up more awareness about that. And Black August, in general, is about political resistance. Um, it's about, uh, and it's about, um, as we'll get to later, commemorating uh, political prisoners. So this is a good time to lift up that story because we have political prisoners here in Indiana. And for me, when I first heard about that, uh, I was like, it's very important to get out. Because a lot of times, those of us who are in the kind of world that talks about political prisoners, like maybe Mamiya, Abu Jamal, or someone of that nature, has no awareness of those who are actually here in Indiana. Uh, it's not the only political prisoners here in Indiana either, but these are the two that we're going to be discussing today. All right, so Black August. Uh, so what is Black August? Uh, it started as a, uh, as a commemoration. And again, I want to I wanna highlight this first point. It is a commemoration, not a celebration. Uh, and this is very important to recognize because there's a lot of celebratory events on different types of black um, subject matters, and that's fine, I'm not knocking that, but this is an ongoing struggle. Um, so we're not celebrating anything, especially when it's an event, or when it's a month that is wanting to honor people who are in prison, that's not something to celebrate. But we do want to honor the struggles that those people have engaged in to move us closer towards freedom. All right, so um, it started, uh, same point of commemoration, uh, it started 42 years ago um, in 1979 outside the walls of San Quentin. San Quentin is in um, California, San Quentin Prison. Um, but the events that led to it, um, we're going to go over those briefly. So on the timeline in 1970, uh, it started the assassination of W.O. Nolan, uh, out who was 23, out in Judge, and then Cleveland Edwards. They were shot in Soledad Prison, another prison in California in the yard by a correctional officer, by the officer name of Opie G. Miller, they had an altercation with the Aryan Nation. So they were in altercation with the Aryan Nation, and the actual guards shot the prisoners from the roof. And then the prisoners had to get out, the black prisoners, to be more specific, they didn't shoot the Aryan Nation, of course. Um, so they shot the black prisoners, so they had to dissipate because they were under attack. Um, this led to a retaliation um, by, I don't know if that's on the slides. Give me the next slide for me. Uh, yeah, so four days later, there was a prison guard that was beaten and thrown off a tier. This was a retaliation. Um, in response, they, they, the state um, charged George Jackson, Fleeta Drumgould, and John Kluchet, who were later known as the Soledad Brothers. Um, the Soledad Brothers is just another collective of political prisoners. Um, and they were charged for the retaliation, even though there really wasn't any real evidence on this. Uh, so that thrust to George Jackson into, uh, into the international spotlight. George Jackson has a relationship to a lot of different people. For those who I'm sure have heard of Angela Davis, um, Angela Davis' FBI case is directly, was not directly, well, pretty much directly tied to George Jackson. She was on a committee similar to the committee that's presenting this to free George Jackson and the Soledad brothers from prison. Um, she was on that committee. And the brother of George Jackson, Jonathan Jackson, um, attempted to break. Next slide, please. Um, attempted to. It looks like that might be a little out of order, but that's okay. Um, so he attempted. Jonathan Jackson attempted to actually um, get George out of prison. Um, he job. He actually planned to take a judge hostage. Um, this was in uh, 1970. Uh, 1970, I believe, and. Uh, no one, he didn't actually hurt anybody. He took a few people hostage. 
including some uh, prisoners at the time who were on trial and a judge. And then the cops showed up and shot. He went into a van. The cops showed up and shot into the van and killed everyone, including the judge. Um, so, now if you if you want to know anything about Attica Rebellion, again, that's the kind of rule that it was at the time. They the state didn't want to give any 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 move for any kind of positioning for political prisoners or for any kind of black revolutionaries, so they would even take out their own. Same thing happened in Attica, 39 people were shot in that prison rebellion, and that was not all guards. 39 people were killed, excuse me, 100 people were injured. 39 people were killed, a lot of those people were guards, some of them were even media, I believe. Uh, and you know, and that's, that's its own story, they tortured someone, they put a football under his neck, and actually ran it through, it was just a lot of stuff there. That's, so that's the type of stuff that leads to this commemoration. Um, there's other events that have happened in Black August, whether we're talking about the Watts Rebellion, whether we're talking about Nat Turner's Rebellion, whether we're talking about the Haitian Revolution, whether we're talking about the March on Washington. Um, there's the birthdays that commemorate like James Baldwin and such. Um, so so uh, uh, even here recently, the last 10 years, the uh, Ferguson Rebellion, the Ferguson Uprising, I'm sure more people are aware of that. That, that started in August as well. Uh, so August has a strong, like, I won't look this up, no. but August has a strong, um, a strong connection to black revolution. It's something I did want to wrap up on the Angela Davis point. I forgot to clean that up. Um, so Jonathan Jackson, like I said, they killed everyone in the vans. The claim was that those guns were Angela Davis's guns. Then Angela Davis had to go on the run and she was on the FBI's most wanted list. And this is pretty much what made her infamous, not just famous, but infamous. She's on like an FBI most wanted flyer and such and such. Um, and you know, she was on, she could have went on death row. Um, so that's kind of what thrust her into the scene. George Jackson is eventually um, assassinated. They claim he tried to sneak a gun into his afro. Now, if you see a picture of George Jackson, he has like a Kobe Bryant fro. It's not a very big fro. So I don't know how you get a gun in that. And I don't know how you put a gun in your fro and go through cops and all of that and somehow. So they claim he tried to sneak a gun in his afro and then they assassinated him. Uh, so honoring that and then Attica happens a year later and they were really responding to what happened to um, George Jackson and then Black August kind of arises as a commemoration of all of these things and the ongoing struggle of political prisoners, whether we're talking about the Mia Abu Jamal, um, whether we're talking about the Sasha Four, uh, whether we're talking about uh, people who have even gotten out but were once locked up. Um, these are, you know, these are people um, who we're trying to commemorate. And then one last point, political prisoners, in case anyone's not clear on what that means, are people who have been targeted by the state for their political stance and for their political actions. So they're not in prison because they robbed a bank, just to rob a bank, or because they um, didn't pay their taxes or whatever. Like that's not why they're in prison. They're in prison because they took a line against the state. Um, so they become locked up because of that. And usually, usually receive some of the most excessive sentences. So someone like Mami Abu Jamal is fighting against police brutality. And if anyone knows anything about the Philadelphia Police Department as back then and even now, they were very racist, but even worse back then. Um, so he got put on death row. Um, and then you also can become a political prisoner in prison. As in, you can be a prisoner who may have went there for whatever reason, but within the prison cells, you realize this is a terrible environment. There's no ability to really rehabilitate here. They're constantly persecuting us. The, the conditions are awful. Um, so maybe we should do something about that. And then the guards will usually target you for that as well. Not just the guards, the ward, and everyone. Captains and law will target you for that. And you can um, get an extended sentence or something of that nature because of that. Um, so that's how we get to the penalty two. Uh, next slide, please. So don't have any slides for penalty two because I want to give more of that to Bayer to speak on. But just a quick overview of who the penalty two are and what the penalty two like what, what that represents. Again, here in Indiana, 19, February 1st, 1985, uh, there was a brother by the name of Lovemar, uh, also known as Lincoln Love, um, who was protesting along with other inmates, um, cleaning supplies and such and such of that nature. And they were doing the, the guards at the time were doing these quote unquote like flipping cells or whatever. 
And they rushed his cell, he was handcuffed, um, and beaten with clubs, damn near to death, um, tear gassed it and such, dragged him out of his cell, pretty much threatened that this was going to happen to everyone else in the prison as well. Now this was not a random thing that was just like, never happened before and the guards were just in a bad mood. This was regularly occurring behavior at the prison. Um, we now have a deposition by the guard who was actually working there at the time, um, his name was Michael Richardson, who reported that this was part, that the guards belonged to what was a KKK, KKK splinter group, Ku Klux Klan splinter group called the Sons of Light. Um, so the guards in the actual, and this is Pendleton now, back then it was Indiana Reformatory, pretty much is ran by a white supremacist group, Klan group. He even says in his deposition that their kids used to play with their Klan roles. Right, so this is who ran the prison. Um, so these are the people who attacked Lincoln Love on this day. Um, so as he dragged out, Balagoon, again, John C. Cole, and Christopher Nine Trotter, they were not the only ones involved. We actually have someone here who was also there as well. They're the, they got the hardest sentences, and they're the ones that still locked up. Um, <clears throat> they and, and, their, and their comrades and the black drivers come to, come to, basically come to rescue Lincoln Love initially peacefully trying to see what was going on if he, because he was in the captain's office and it was understood that if he were in there, he probably would either get beat to death or severely beaten, almost nearly to death. So they wanted to see what was going on. Then they were attacked by the guards. Melee broke out. The guards had to go and kill them um, in order to save their lives um, after they had already saved Lincoln Love's life. But if they not going to be, they probably would have just kept beating him. Um, they took a few guards and others who were in the prison hostage. They rushed into cell house J. They occupied their cell house for about 15 to 16 hours. Um, and they had a series of demands regarding the conditions, um, food, um, black, actual black guards that would be in there because there weren't really any at the time, and so on and so forth. The invited guards and some more, some of this. Um, <clears throat> no one died. You know, they had ample opportunity if that was their actual mission to do that because they had oxygen. Nobody died. Um, they called the media. Um, it is, there is documentation that this happened, but it just kind of disappeared from history. Um, and then once again, um, Trotter and Ballard go received um, 142 and 84 years, and they spent um, 20 and uh, 32 years in solitary refinement, respectively. Right? Um, so they're still in prison. Like this hasn't ended, this isn't like a story that there's a good ending right now. We can create a good ending, but there's not a good ending to it right now, right? Uh, so today, again, we're trying to give you an overview of what Black August is, as I just did, but also connected to this struggle. Um, so we have someone with us, um, Bayi Sylvester, that's the man you see on the flyer, not me. <laughs> so we're gonna bring Bayi up. I do wanna read his bio before I bring him up. Um, and then we're we'll gonna get him the mic and it'll be a pretty interactive dialogue. <clears throat> uh, Bayez Sylvester is a survivor of um, long-term imprisonment with Indiana's most oppressive institutions. Born and raised in Chicago during his formative years in Illinois, Baye was an early victim of what is now referred to as, quote, from the schoolyard to the prison yard, end quote. Held captive for over 25 years, his survival and present ability to work in the service of people has roots deep in the soil of revolutionary consciousness. Politicized by the oppressive conditions of confinement, Baye formed an awareness that the path from survival to freedom begins with liberating the mind from shackles of indoctrination. He presently is serving as a community, he's presently serving his community as a certified recovery specialist um, slash community health worker, as well as being deeply in, embedded in the service of harm reduction. So give it up for uh, Baye Sylvester. I want to first and foremost give uh, you all my undivided appreciation for coming out this evening. Uh, I know it's not guaranteed when we put on events like this here that we're going to get a crowd, but whenever someone shows up, I'm deeply appreciative of that and appreciative of that. The slides that you just saw and Two Blacks' iteration of Black August was, was on point. I want to expand upon that because Black August has morphed and it morphed early on, early on and it wasn't, you know, not just about 
those individuals behind prison walls who were, had the courage to stand up against oppression. But what it also does is, represent, is representative of each and every person who have challenged something that was wrong in their community. Black August is about Emmett Till. Black August is about Fred Hampton. Black August is about the countless children that are missing and everybody who questions those children that's missing or anything that's oppressive in our community, everything from the dumping of toxic waste in our communities to the underfunding of education to the, the, the roadblocks that's put up against us for adequate medical care and so on and so forth. I'm talking about going back. This Black August is about the person, whoever, whoever that was, that challenged, that challenged some slave uh, uh, merchant that came on any parts of Africa and made somebody do something against their will. That's what this is about. It is, it is broad and it has to begin to reverberate within our souls and what we're about. When you talk about Attica, you, you, most people don't understand that the resistance, the history of resistance behind prison walls began on the plantation. And so the examples that they made of individuals on the plantation is the same thing that they're doing today in prisons. And it's been going on. And the tragedy of all this here is that some of the most atrocious things done to our people happens in the juvenile system. In the juvenile system. And I mean, everything from the way they use DCS to strip these black and brown children from their families, and they, they say that they're supposed to transition them back into their families within 18 months, but it's a big business. You have folks out here who are capitalizing on it. And not only are they taking the children, right now they're demanding that these parents, that they took these children from, pay child support and all kinds of stuff. No, we're going to use them, you can't use them on your, your taxes, and all kinds of stuff. But we hear about black officers, I'm here to talk to you about the resistance movement in this country. The resistance move, movement in this country is, is one of the most foremost resistant movements in the world. When you think about that this country is, I mean, has hegemony over most other countries when it comes to military might, brainwashing other people. The average person you talk to in this here particular country can't even begin to talk to you about class consciousness. They can, everything is hung up on race, but they, they more apt to look at your skin color than to look at the fact that we got more in common as a class. You got all these folks who ran around talk, calling themselves Trump heights and this and that there, knowing damn well they can't go to Mar-a-Lago. They can't get up in Trump Tower, and they think they got something in common. It's foolishness. The seeds of, of rebellion. I want to read something to you all real quick. I think it's important that you understand this here. Because I like to move from the general to the particular. Y'all with me? Mm -hmm. All right, good. A rebellion is inherently meaningful. It connotes resistance to authority or control. A riot, by contrast, disturbs an otherwise peaceful society. Behind the walls of the Indiana Reformatory, as it was known in P-Town and other names, there was no peaceful. There was no peace for those black and brown prisoners in there. He shared with you about the sons of light, about these uh, um, administrators, because it worked from the top down, who was allowing these guards to openly and with just one time abuse folks. And I'm going to tell you something. You cannot continuously to abuse somebody and degrade somebody and they don't do something to you. So we got to understand that there too. So we're talking about this cycle of de de this de 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 And so in the history of rebellion in this country, all of these incidents, don't no one just wake up on a given day and say, well, hey, you know, we're just going to take over the prison and put ourselves in a position to get our lives taken or get a, a 112 years or 84 more years. That's not how that works. But the, the, the dissent, the dissension in the, what's going on inside there is that this constant degradation, this constant abuse by those in authority and power. When 
article was going on, they don't talk about it, but the Pendleton riot in 1985, as, as ugly as it was with regards to what happened to John Cole and uh, um, Balagoon and Naeem Trotter, little need is, is being said about what happened in 1969 when over 100 black prisoners took their shirts off, got on the yard, demanding humane treatment. Humane treatment. And this guard, the captain had told this guards that they stood around with their shotguns, if I throw my hat down, shoot them. And he got, it was a peaceful, wasn't nobody taking hostage, wasn't no cell houses being burned up, none of that. But they shot. They killed one and wounded 47. Some people probably, if they still alive, they're walking around with scars right now. And his answer was, I didn't order them to do that. Somebody accidentally knocked my hat off. That's how egregious, how nothingness they felt that these lives were. And so in, in this country, rebellion is no different behind the walls than when the seeds of discontent explodes in a community. Pressure will bust a pipe. But when we're sentenced to prison, that's the punishment. You have no right because you wear a suit and you have the authority that you are signed on the paper to say, okay, I'm a guard, officer, uh, correctional officer in the Indiana State Prison or whatever prison. That don't give me no right to dehumanize you. But that's what's going on. If, you, if the conditions are atrocious and I say, hey, man, look, you know, there's no hot water in my cell. There's no, you know, uh, um, the ventilation is crazy. It's, it's smothering in here. And, and I found a grievance about these here conditions. And your, your, your uh, retort is to attack me and to brutalize me. And if I have any affinity for anybody in this room and I stand here as a human being, I got every right to come to your aid. Every right. But these are the conditions that not only permeated in, in the Indiana Reformatory, it runs rapid throughout the whole DOC. Now you gotta understand this here too. Think about where prisons categorically and historically have been located in rural areas where if the, the economy is, is, um, is depressed, you bring a prison in. You bring a prison in. So now there's jobs to come in there and work. The, the merchants in that area, they have an opportunity to sell goods to the institution. The egos are inflated. And they know and now, look, you're a commodity. You're not just a number, you're a commodity for me. And then the advent of the, 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 the private prison. This prison industrial, con, uh, um, industrial complex is a parasite on American society. They say that you, I don't know who said it, but it was written that you can determine the justice of a society by how it's treat, it treats its least. It's poor, it, it, it's in prison, and it's infirm. So in Attica, when Attica was going on, they were demanding the same thing that they were demanding in, in penalty. <clears throat> Cessation of the beatings. They were giving, they were giving them, them, them men down there one roll of tissue a month in Africa. These individuals were having to, the windows were being broken out by guards and stuff. And so all, and this is upstate New York. It gets cold up there. No, you can't have that blanket. Your punishment for not being this and that there, we're gonna come in there and strip you of, of um, your basic necessities. So when these men stood up at Attica, I'm going to tell you how egregious that the state of New York under Rockefeller was, and Faulkner, the guy Oswald, was the guy was the DOC commissioner at the time in the state of New York, that they knew they had separate meetings that, hey, we're going to listen to them because that's what we want the public to see. Hey, we gave them an opportunity. But they knew then. We're going to take this over and we're going to kill whoever we got to kill. If those guards in there and they haven't found their way out or talked their way out, then they're going to die too. They understood that there when they signed up. This is the atmosphere of which was going on in Attica. 
with men who were infantile in their, in their mental capacities and somehow got pushed through the criminal justice system instead of getting some help, wind up in prison, and because of their mental health situation, could not control themselves, were beaten to death, were experimented on. I got some brothers in here right now that was in the DOC with me. The doctor that was at Pendleton that we had to go see was a veterinarian. A veterinarian. And so I'm supposed to trust this. When I'm looking at your arms, I'm seeing insignias of white supremacy. You know, and I'm, I'm you know, these are the conditions. Now check this out. You have young men coming from these inner cities who have already been traumatized and led to believe that they don't deserve nothing more than what they see in their community. They don't understand at the time about gentrification. They don't understand what, what the plan was to bring iPhone 65 through the neighborhood and break down, you know, these type of things. They don't know nothing about this here. They think that their conditions is a result of the people that is near and dear to them. They don't know that these people that I look like them and near and dear to them have only just been trying to survive. So in the midst of that, they come inside the institutions, especially in the last 30 years. So you get these babies that was born in, 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 in the late 60s and early 70s on the heels of the Black Power Movement, on the heels of the Weather Underground and the FALN challenging this government, on the heels of Stop the War and the Anti-Nuclear when they was, our federal government was sending nuns and stuff to prison for saying no nukes. They don't know nothing about this here. And so when they come into this world of being defined solely by the fact that you the descendant of a slave and Though my situation ain't too much better than yours, at least I am who I say I am. And the people who are in control of this multi-billion dollar industry, they look like me. They look like me, so that means that I'm better than you. And so these are the sordid ideas that, that, that we ran into. But these youngsters, they weren't prepared for that. So when they started experiencing vicariously who Jonathan Jackson was, who George Jackson was, when they found out about the, the, the fact that when they was in RDC or any other sale house, they, hey man, your story is my story. This got to be more than a coincidence. And so they start politicizing themselves and the DOC wasn't ready for it either. In, 1990, in 1977, they changed the Indiana Penal Code from the Byrne Statute to this determinate sentence. And young men like myself was coming into the system. You know, I turned 18 in jail. I had 92 years when I got to prison. I ain't kill nobody. I ain't rape nobody. So I asked myself, where's the justice? And I look at these other individuals, where's the justice? And so I say that there to say this here, that for years, this is the reality. So when they come across the news and they say it's been an uprising, they're rioting. That's not a riot. That is a rebellion and we got to know the difference between that. And so we can move on to 2000, what I got it right here. In 1986, some of you were still up in the job back there, he was there with me, at the Indiana State Prison. The condition, people would like to think that are up north, you got a sprinkling of black officers and this and that, there. it's up north, it's better. Let me tell you something, when that cell don't shut, jail is jail. Yeah. And it don't make no difference who's standing on your neck, what it look like. Because the truth of the matter is this here, the same black officers from Michigan City and Gary and South Bend and East Chicago would have been talking slick and want to play cards and dominoes with you when the rebellions jumped off and the captain said, suit up, they were the ones standing in front of you like, get your black ass in there for I kill So we got to be clear on this here. Because just because somebody looked like us don't mean that our conditions were different or that they were our friends. Yeah. You know, we got to be distinct about that. Many of us are clear. It's not saying that there was no 
of some discussions and just talking, meaning talk, but many of us, we knew who they were. We knew who their allegiance was to. In 1986, he was coming back from, from, um, from child, not from, from the rec unit. And it's about 8.50 in the evening because we got back and we had to lock down at 9 o'clock. One of the sons of this soil right here, Brother Mustafa, better known as Mal Goodman, was attempting to talk to somebody about trying to feed himself to somebody else. And the guy get in his face and talk to him like he had a tail with the finger. Now this brother about what, 6162? Broad at the shoulders. He on the walker now, but at that time he was he was he he go. <laughs> and it all jumped off like that. Because they thought you gonna do what I tell you to do, you gonna do I tell you gonna do it the way I tell you to do it, and don't make no difference if I'm right or wrong, I got this suit on. It wasn't happening like that. And then go another uprising because people were tired. And you had people that had never had a write-up in the history of their incarceration that came forth and said, let me help. Because it was burning inside of them. They were tired of this here. New Mexico, 1980. The same situation. Before Ferguson jumped off, we had never heard of Ferguson. Missouri, if you weren't from Missouri. But it took center stage in our country and captured the minds and the spirit of the people for what? For weeks. For weeks. This thread of discontent runs deep. Runs deep. I'm a member of the African People's Social Party, okay? Been a long-standing member. And we have an uh, 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 offset, uh, the African People's Solidarity Committee. You know, and this is a party made up of Europeans, white people. And so, you know, it used to be a thing where as in the late 60s and the early 70s, folks would come in and they would say, okay, I, we with y'all. You know, what can we do? Well, what we need you to do, if you politicize and you understand the plight of what's going on, we don't need you to go down in our hood. We're going to handle this here. Go back and tell, explain to your own what's really going on and that these lives matter, just like your lives matter. And that's, that's the situation. So we moved forward to Westville. I think it was 2020, or right around the time of the COVID really started being defined. Now all the nonsense was going on about the China flu, this, that, and the other. People were fearful. The streets were kind of bare and stuff. But behind those walls, it was a whole lot of indifference. They say, according to the CDC and other researchers, that the death rate in the community when this thing was at its, at its height out here was 80 per 100,000. In the institutions across the country, it was 190, close to 200. But what was being said, they feel these people are expendable. They're expendable. And so the, they started writing, so we want, we want masks. We want some, some sanitizer. Basic things. It's a pandemic, so you say it is. Some folks call it a pandemic. I need that up to you all. But the fact of the matter is this here is that without power corrupts, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. You all heard it. And the fact that if you think that we can trust, that we can trust these individuals that govern these institutions to do right by our sons, our daughters, our cousins, our family members, without us having some insight to it, then we damn fooling ourselves. It's a reason why it's cloaked in obscurity. They don't want you to know what's going on behind it. You know, here's individuals who are stressed out. A lot of these, these officers, they stressed out, they upset, and then you got that other factor that sounds alike that, that, that's breathing in some of them ear. Hey, the real problem is these here individuals. You know, this is how you get some rank. You can't show no weakness. We watching you. And that's what, what, what Black was talking about when he talked about Richardson, this officer who had, they had tried to recruit to be a part of them. 
In some way, somehow, somebody must have shown him some compassion or he understood what ethics, ethics and moral morality meant because he pushed back. He pushed back. But when it came time for the trial, it was held right there near Elwood, Indiana. We all know about Elwood, Indiana if you've done any kind of research. And the, the judge is refusing to, to recuse people. He's refusing to let in certain evidence, such as the evidence you just spoke about. So where is the justice? The 13th Amendment says in, 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 in black and white that slavery is outlawed except if a person is what, duly convicted? Now what is duly? Tell me what that poses me. It don't say that you have to be justly convicted. It says duly. And so this is, 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 is the backdrop to why these incidents of rebellions, and they're going to keep cropping up. Because when you know that you don't have no, no where are you going to run to? Where are you going to run to? And there's many people in there who feel like this here. I'm going to die standing up and not on my knees. My own trial, four months to be released. Four months. He didn't come to prison on a 20 year, 50 year sentence like some of us. No. He came because of his beliefs. But he only had like four months now or less. John Balagoon Cole had a 20 year sentence. He had already served over seven years of that sentence. Over seven years. So with this uprising as they want, whatever they want to call it, they were beating Lincoln Love, look brother Lokmar, stomping him, kicking him in his testament, beating him with clubs, laughing and giggling about him, and then dragging him across the institution, across the grounds, like he was just some, like I done shot a damn deer and I'm just dragging him back to the car, taking him to skin it or whatever. These brothers sacrificed. Yeah, they did. They sacrificed and they stood up because they knew that at any given time, that could be me. That could be me. And so when we talk about the history of, of resistance in this country, it, this, it's a long thread of it. This thread goes way back. You know, and so I remember when I first started getting politicized and I would get the journals and the Guardian and so on and so forth and I would, I, I began to, to know vicariously who was the Weather Underground and all these other European, you know, uh, revolutionaries, the David Gilbert's, the Sylvia Burdines and whatnot. You know, these were individuals who stood up and said that this privilege that I got has been unearned, and so I'm giving it back to you because it's false and it's fake, and it's not willing, I'm not willing to have it if it's got to be dependent upon me degrading and dehumanizing somebody else, another human being. And so the, 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 the seeds of resistance, this is still going on now. Right now, behind Pelican Walls, you have shop supervisors who are saying, hey, I can go to classification. We're sending you over to the, this shop or that shop. You get over, they say, no, nah, I don't need you. This white person go through there and say, yeah, because his buddies are saying, hey, man, he's one of ours. Now, when you talk about weapons in the joint, that's who got weapons because they got access to the means to produce them and they're working in conjunction quite often with these officers. And these officers is, is, is stewing this discontent. So, during Black August, it's important for us to really, to, to not, you don't have to accept anything that I'm saying, you can do this research on your own. I really, I encourage you to do so. But the, the, the primary focal point needs to be my humanity, each and every one of us. What does my humanity mean to me? What does it mean? Everyone that we see land in a doorway, everyone we see who may be handcuffed because he's committed a property crime, because he's fell under the weight of addiction, that's, that's system-oriented stuff, if quite often. 
They are still human beings. They deserve to be treated like human beings. They deserve to be treated like human beings. We all got issues. It ain't so much as who got the damn issue, it's what you're doing about your issue. This prison industrial complex, these brothers that are still behind this wall, we can talk about them, but better than yet, we can talk about so many others who were unjustly convicted and have been languishing in there 37, 40 years, 50 years. Come on now. So we have to ask ourselves, if I'm really about humanity and I'm really about uplifting it, then what right is right and wrong is wrong. They talk about the state has a super majority in the state house. That don't absolve you of your responsibility to be just because you got all the numbers. You still have to act according to the needs of the people. But if the people don't say, I'm not in, 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 in agreement with what you're doing, they'll keep on doing what they're doing. Uhuru. That's a Swahili word that means freedom. And when we say Uhuru, Sasa means now. Uhuru Sasa. That's freedom now. These individuals, these brothers that's in, that's in here, in the, in the joint now, they deserve an opportunity to walk these streets. That's the problem with these communities. Because people don't want to accept the fact that it's a short drive from Hallville to Geis to Fishes. My frustration can spill out right there. If I'm hopeless, miserable, lost, you know, it can spill out right there. But more often, it's not spilling out there. More often, it's spilling out against people right in the same neighborhoods that's going through the same thing. And so people like to say, well, that's their problem. And so, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, what, what is all this here about? It's one thing to say, well, I ain't part of the problem, or I'm not a racist, but is you anti? And if you is, is you willing to stand up and say so? Are you willing to challenge somebody? Our, DC, our DOC watch is um, not a fledgling. We ain't going nowhere. But forward. But forward. This committee to free Naeem in Balagoon, the fact that the numbers may be small right now, we ain't going nowhere before. We committed to this here. I remember reading Nelson Mandela, and he said, the struggle is my life, and my life belongs to the struggle. If that, 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 that is so true, each, each and every one of us, in some capacity, because we all have the opportunity to help somebody. And right now, that's what we need. We need to get the word out. We need to tell the truth about this here. We need for these individuals in, in, in all these campaigns, you know, it's, we need more than just myself coming down here. For, I'm from up north, but it don't make no difference. If I had to drive to wherever I was willing to do it, because it's wrong for these men to have to steal language in prison for something, a situation, it wasn't a riot. They should be labeled as heroes because they stopped them from killing somebody, caught up in, the, in, in, in their madness. Prison rebellions, prison resistance, community rebellions, community resistance. The question for me is why? Why? Why are we here today? Are we here just to hear ourselves talk? Are we here so we can learn some more about something that's going on? Are we fetish, have fetishes about what goes on beyond you know, the prison walls? I hope not. We're talking about human beings. This struggle is serious. People don't realize that in the struggle in, in New Mexico, was over 40 men died. Yeah. And every opportunity we get to check an out of control government or an abusive government, we need to do that. Your voice, 
you don't know who gonna, who, who's going to hear you. And that's what we need to do. Now, I want to ask you all something. How many people in here know someone personally that's either been to prison, I mean, you know it personally, or just in prison right now, family or free? Okay. Okay. So, the rights of prisoners is not secured in laws or institutional policy. The rights of prisoners, don't, don't get it twisted. It's not secured in laws or institutional policies. The rights of prisoners are kept by those who hold the administrators and the guards in check. And that's us out here. That's us. Because, let me tell you something. If the recidivism rate in the state of Indiana is what they say it is, or you see people just going in and out and they coming out, you know, here's a person say, I've been in prison five times. And you don't even have a GED. Is it my fault? But you put me to work in the tag shop. You had me mowing some grass, but uplifting me and giving me something to work with was not of a concern. Then, if it was a business, you would say, well, hey, you, you know, I want to return this here. I'm talking about billions of dollars going into a present fund. So we have to educate ourselves about the realities of what's going on behind prison. And we use this opportunity of Black August because it is very personal to us. Because I know that the Fannie Lou Hamers, the George Jacksons, the, the so many others, the, the um, Fred Hamptons and the Mark Clarks, they weren't talking about just the liberation of black people. They were talking about destroying imperialism in colonial, the colonial relationship. They was talking about tearing the, 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 uh, the, the veil off of class so we can understand that we are working class people. And that, th this, this system of separation is intentional. It's intentional. I remember being in prison and um, guys was talking about what's the primary contradiction confronting African people in this country. And everybody probably today would still respond, oh, it's racism. And this one brother, uh, he said, no, it ain't. It's, yeah, he said, it's our material relationship with the, with the government. Our material relationship. The fact that they produce everything and got control of everything, and we don't. And it went, this conversation went a little bit further. And he highlighted, he told us, he said, let me tell y'all something about the ruling class. Let me tell y'all something about colonialism. Let me tell you something about international imperialism. International imperialism is, is hell-bent on staying where they at. And if it means I can bring this six-foot-two bearded black man up in here and put him in a position as president, as long as we still in charge of the means of production and everything else, more power to you. Get on up there. Y'all can clap for him. Vote for him. Two times. You know? Y'all know what I'm talking about. But the material conditions down here on the ground, I don't have nothing in common with Barack Obama. I'm not part of his class other than the fact, you know what I'm saying, we got some African ancestry. That's the reality of what I'm talking about. I got more in common with you all than I got with him because you sitting here and you understand that there's a need for us to be accountable and to hold one another accountable. And that's what we have to do. So when I was in prison, we ran a thing called the Black Studies class. And well, I used to talk to especially young brothers. And there, many of them, you know, like myself, had rushed brushed up against street organizations. The media's gonna say they're gangs. You know, they're street organizations, they organize. And it's indigenous responses when, you know, if I don't feel no hegemony, if I don't feel no love at home, and me and you sharing the same dilemma, I don't care what you look like, then that's my family. You know, but we just say that, you know, hopefully, if nothing else come out of this process of reading and listening to us and trying to transform that colonial criminal mentality, that colonial criminal mentality, 
the drive-bys that they talk about, these shootings, they showed that junk on Elliot Ness. You know, long before, you know, they were doing it in the hood. That's when you saw it at. And they mimic all this and stuff, these drive-bys and stuff. We were saying, hey, listen, don't go out praying on your community. Because, and we began to break that down and explain it to them. And so there are so many broken individuals right now that's filled inside of these institutions, looking for answers, hoping that somebody will remember them. I remember being in the courtroom. I remember I was 15 years old. They said, well, you being, um, they going to weigh me over to adult court. I was 15 years old. I said, what are you talking about? You know, I said, what are you talking about? Oh, don't worry about that. You know, I called home, I said, yeah, they're going to weigh me to a dope court. What that mean? I said, I don't know yet, let me find out. And you know, but this is the thing. Now, I remember being in jail with the little white kid. We was all in the jewel down block one time. And um, he had, um, he had did something very violent to a girl at school. But the dentist was there, the pastor was there. You know, and all these others. But when we go in there, we don't have that kind of, you know. <coughs> and if we do come, we got crying mothers begging. We don't have that kind of social capital because we've been pushed out of it. And that's the reality. We got these fallacies. And people are romanticizing the struggle. They're romanticizing what's going on behind these walls. You got some. I'm thinking that where well, it's a reunion, but they don't understand. You ain't guaranteed to make it out because the, the, the controllers of the gate may not, they may not be in a part of their they, they, uh, they intent. In South Carolina in 2018, there was a, 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 a prisoner who was well known in the institution, always trying to help folks out, didn't have much of nothing. You know, they worked, they worked the farms down in that kind of states, you know, outside. He got caught with some bread, some bread. And on the way to, to, to taking him, instead of just taking the bread and saying, hey, get on out of here, they took him out and they beat him. And they laughed about him. And there was some other prisoners that said, shit ain't right. And in that instance, it wasn't just no black people, there were some other prisoners as well. And they got even. They went to try to liberate them, just like these other brothers did. And it morphed. But this is the situation. You've heard of some of you, you know, from academia may have heard of the, the Stanford projects where they had these everyday people go into the prison house and try to have to close down and take on these roles as guards and stuff. And it wasn't long, just like that. They started dehumanizing and mistreating others. And it was just an experiment. So, prison rebellions. You know, rebellions, quite often, is the only grievous process that's going to be heard. It shouldn't be that way. We need to not only demand the release of these prisoners, we need to, 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 to link our arms and our minds together and ask for openness. They need, we need to know who's doing, who's having these grieving processes, who's sitting on the parole boards. If they're serving flat sentences and, and I come out here and I get a technical infraction and they send me back to prison, I come back for a technical infraction. Well, we, you're denied, we'll see you in five years. Five years on technicalities. There are probably hundreds of thousands of people locked up across the country for technical violations. They ain't committing no new crime. These institutions that we fund as taxpayers, we have a right to know what's going on. We, our voice needs to be heard. It needs to be heard. People don't understand that there are many incidents of rebellion. 
There are many Lokmars in prison. Lincoln Love has been beaten. Y'all understand what a potter's field is, don't you? You know, there's a lot of grave sites outside the prison walls that ain't got nothing but a number on them. You know, oppression, murder is murder to me. If I deny you medical care, I'm killing you intentionally. And so these things is something that we need to pay attention to. We need to wrap our arms around this cause to free these individuals. And, and before I end, I want to say this here. This brother here, Minka Beck Timber, when we talk about the, the, the 1985 riot, as they want to define it, but we know it was a rebellion, then that was demands. That's okay, we'll sit down, we'll negotiate. The same thing went on in Attica. Oh, we gonna negotiate over these days, you need this. Okay, okay, okay. There was no talk about this persecution and sending these brothers in front of these courts to be charged like this, and none of the guards got charged. And to this day, nobody has been charged. And for other incidents in which malfeasance has taken place, just recently, in recent years, a man at the Indiana State Prison, the cell car on fire electrical uh, with the electric box. He's hollering and screaming. It took them I don't know how long just to come upstairs and see what's happening. And you can see the smoke and the flame jumping out, curling up under the van. And when it was all said and done, they had to send another prisoner in there to shovel his skin that had melted off his body. Hmm. You ask your question about what's this? Why, why they resisting? Why they rebelling? Why we ain't resisting? Why we not rebelling against them out there? These are tight dollars that they're using to do this with. <laughs> We need to open our mouths and use our voices because these operations are hit and we should have a right to know what's going on and demand. This brother right here, Minka Beck Timmer, he was part of that rebellion. He stood there. Because I'm going to tell you something, just coming to sit down and negotiate brought about a charge. Just trying to negotiate. I'm glad to see my brother out here. I applaud him for the work that he's doing in trying to save lives and recovery. Every time I see him, I see Ray, I see Lil John, any one of the other brothers that survived. Because it wasn't intent for us to come back out. It wasn't. And it wasn't intent for us to come out here and to be standing here and supporting these here causes. We're supposed to be a statistic of a negative strung out, diseased, or back in there for harming somebody that ain't getting nothing to us, other than being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I could talk all day, but thank you. Thank you. What you're feeling, what you're thinking. Come on with that too. Excuse me. My name is Kirk Delay. Um, I'm about to go to that level. So um, I'll be 45 Saturday. From the riots from, I'm born in 77. So a lot of my, I say, allies and comrades from the streets were like 45 and up. And, um, Thing you said affected me because of the school curriculum, school I went to, IBS, and things like that. So, um, you may have a positive impact on me right now. So, because I'm currently involved dealing with the area brother, I don't call him here, but I call him crackers. You know what I'm saying? So, I got involved with with the Ku Klux Klan here because my last name is Delay, and they hid that from me. That's the Grand Dragon. Founder and Green Family out of Hancock County. These crackers, you can tell me that. You know what I'm saying? So, I'm married to a hunky. 
you know what I'm saying? That you're, I'm very much like raised to a point where it's like it's a, something's like a uniform. Racism is like a uniform. Because I've been like CCA corporate jails, like took. You know what I'm saying? I knew that with that, that. You know what I'm saying? Most of my family are lords and things like that. And these, they wore <clears throat> uniforms in the German schools teaching. So I think you're saying I'm an and things like that. I'm currently involved online with some things right now. So I'm glad that you showed up. You know what I'm saying? Thank you had no idea, man. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I like to Hey, brother, brother, hey, man. Uh, thank you, brother. Showing up, articulating that the way you did, brother. You know, to people that don't understand. You know what I mean? They did a great job, brother. I appreciate that. Because I, I know somebody picked up on something. You know, that, that they didn't understand. Even, he, even uh, my partner right here, I'm sure she did. Somebody had to, you know. Thank you for that, brother. I took a that. Thank you. Hey, brother, hey, same thing. I know you know how I love to see you doing what you're doing. Okay? And I want to add something. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Ray Lady. And I am a formerly homeless, honorably discharged, retired, and disabled United States Marine. And I spent seven years in prison. And I also live with a severe mental illness. I also am a certified recovery specialist, community health worker. And I realized a long time ago, because I was in some of those black study classes, quite a few of them, as a matter of fact, and I realized, for lack of a better way to put it, the injustice that was going on each and every day. And I realized, I said, man, how can I do this? Yes, and I, hey, knowing what I know, I would love, seriously, to do it a different way, but I realize that if you want to change that beach, you got to change that beach from the inside out. Alright, and part of what I do today, I'm a member of two state commissions, the Indiana Behavioral Health Commission and Indiana Disability Rights Commission. Yesterday, the executive director, she asked me, do you know anybody who would be willing to go into the prisons and talk with prisoners? Okay, so that we can at least try to change some of that. And I was able to get at least one so far, but I stand here or sit here right here right now and I say, if you would like to do that, and it's a paid position, give me your name and number. Let me tell you about that, Hey, um, I just want, before the, the mic goes any further, I just want to acknowledge one of the, the survivors and the soldiers of the, 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 the crew yeah. chief in the Indiana Department of Correction. That brother back there that just walked in and you all saw yeah. come in, that's Brother Mustafa back there. That's Brother Mustafa Miles Goodner. And I thank you, bro. This is one of the, when I talked about some of these girls, when I was giving you all an example about C-Cell House and he said, not tonight. You ain't gonna talk to me in that kind of way, and that go that S H I T gonna start right here. That's my brother right there. That's my an example of courage, an example of resilience, resilience, and even when we thought he wasn't listening, he was listening. Yep, he was listening. Thank you, brother. Anybody? Anybody? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. I really appreciate you doing this friend. Um, I mean, open my eyes to a lot. I used to work at a law firm, and we represented the medical facility that was in prisons. And I didn't stay at that law firm long. It was the way they, it was terrible. Unprofessional, laughing, it was horrible. But I always struggle because I, I want to do something, and I'm stuck. Um, but I did come across an article about a young man, his name is Malik Muhammad. He was um, involved in the um, protest here in Indianapolis, George Floyd, back in 2020. He actually led a protest. The news showed him ending the protest. He hugged the cop. Four days later, he met with the governor. But then in September, 
September, this, that happened in June. September, he went to Portland. Things got out of control. And he's now in prison for 10 years for throwing them, you know, for allegedly, you know, throwing a Molotov cocktail, caught a cop on fire. He's, he was a good kid. I mean, I, okay, maybe, I don't know, but he didn't have a, a rap. He didn't, I mean, he was, he had a dairy farm in Madison County. It was just crazy. I, and I'm reading this like, this is really wrong. What can I do? So I wrote him a letter. I haven't heard back from him. I just kept it real brief because I've never done that before. And I just, I'm like, tell me your story because this doesn't sound right. It sounds like he's been, um, it's like he's a political prisoner. So I don't know. Do you have any suggestions? Well, you um, initiated the first step. And there is no one way about going, showing someone solidarity. The humanity that you demonstrated in reaching out to him probably carries more weight than any letter you could have wrote to the governor or anybody else at this particular time. Follow, you got to follow that up and try to find out, you know, if there's anything going on locally up there you know, that you can, you know, be a part of, you know, from this distance and help out. Now, if you all was listening from the beginning, I read a definition. And that definition was about riot and rebellion. What, 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 was, what, was, the, what was the riot? Rebellion. What was the, what, what, how did I define the riot? It says, I said, struck a peaceful. And what was the rebellion? Rising up against, Rising up against you know, uh, um, unlawful order and stuff. He was there rebelling. With the, and he had a right to rebel against injustice. And so, you know, I'm quite sure, because he's in Portland, you say? Yeah, Portland, eh? there's it's, it's some organizing going on up in Portland. You know, so I don't know all the particulars of it, but you have to look into that. But, you know, and ask him. He knows what he needs. You can ask him. But I'm asking you right now, that same spirit, that same want to, we need you. John Balagoon Cole needs you. Naeem Trotter needs you. And there's countless others. And that's what I'm saying, you know. We have to recognize that right on this soil, here in Indiana, we got our own politicized and political prisoners that are languishing. And if you want to get involved, cut your teeth right here. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Ed Mississippi and moved here in 05 after Katrina. And I heard the home goings of brothers and sisters writing about going back and forth to prison. I've not understood that struggle. I'm not a, I'm not a part of that. I don't understand it. So I appreciate you, my brother, for explaining it a little bit better for me because, like I said, I'm still a country guy. So I didn't understand all of that. Um, during the so-called riots here, I went downtown to see what I could do. And I talked with a business owner and told him, I said, those kids are kids. Instead of them being somebody else's kids, they're our kids walking for justice. Instead of saying, hey, those kids are just about taking stuff because that's where I'm from. I'm from that great state where everybody says Mississippi is burning, but you don't know the fire that's in the heart of Mississippi and you can be one of us that actually express it a different way. So I appreciate you, my brother. I really do. I appreciate you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, 
you know, you can read things. Uh, there's so much that comes across. We have access to everything at our fingertips. Um, but like, and you know, you're amazing. You bring things to life. You, you can touch people in a way that is a gift. And like, it moves me to want to do something. And I think you have that power to do that, and this organization is like you have it. Thank you. Two Black, we got one from the Zoom, if we could get this. Read it. Uh, I can unmute or we might be able to hear through the speaker here. Oh, uh, Hopefully we don't have it. feedback or anything. Yeah. You just let the speaker play by us. Okay. Queen, do you have a question? chapter of the Black Panther Party had a spot and I would go there. My brothers, you know, I would see these posters of Huey P. Dew sitting in the rack in the tire chair and stuff. And so uh, I was, it piqued my interest. But uh, I was, this is very true, I was first um, accosted by the criminal justice system when I was like about eight years old, man. And I was taken to the Audi home on Taylor Street you know, on the west side of Chicago. Um, and so, you know, my, my relationship, when I got to prison, I was, I was always a studious individual, but someone heard me talking. And I was, you know, I still had a lot of street in me. Yeah, what up, man, you know, this and that there. And so, this guy said, I don't understand what you're talking about, talk to me. And he said, what? and uh, his name was Brother Opio, Homer Reed out of, um, Evansville, and there's another son of this soil named um, Douglas Shackleford that we know as Brother Achebe. And um, they told me to read something. They said, read this here. So I read this book. They gave me this book by Usini Perkins. And, it, and this book was called Home is a Dirty Street. And when I started reading it, I said, hey, man, this is my story in this book. This guy talking about me, Byron Ball, Harry Wilson, and the rest of us. We the ones that were busting these windows out, these stories he's telling. This is how I felt because it was in my neighborhood. So that opened me up and I started listening. And then, you know, just listening and then trying to explain things. Like I said, you know, I felt some kind of way. You know, I said, wow, 18 years old, you know, I got 92 years. I ain't, I ain't, you know, so what's up with this here? And I'm walking around, I'm seeing you all, and I'm hearing y'all stories and stuff, and it just uh, just awakened the hunger in me to try to explain things. You know, try to explain things. And I didn't like nobody telling me, oh yeah, you're going to work in the carpenter shop. But I said, I ain't going to work in no carpenter shop. I ain't come here to work, you know? I, I was mad, I was upset, you know, about the situation I was in. And so that just, I started experience, I started reading Lennon, George, all these stories. I studied the, um, the Russian Revolution. I studied all these different things because I wanted to get an understanding, I wanted to get a worldview. Now, a lot of people don't know this here, and I don't talk about this here much, but um, I was raised, my mother sent me to a Catholic school early on in my life, you know? And so um, I went all the way through confirmation, given the name and everything, you know, but I always had questions. And I remember getting hit with this ruler on my, on my knuckles for questions, for questions. I wasn't a bad kid, I was curious, you know, and so it was these type of things I started to reflect on. And so when I got there, I just knew that, hey, I had, to, it, it was just that energy, I could identify with it. I could identify with it. 
And um, I remember it was a, they had a professor up in the school, in, in the NSB building, and I had to just go in the library one day, broke security, ran upstairs because I wanted to holler at somebody out of place. And um, it was just saying on the wall, it was written on the wall, and it said, time plus space with a negative concept of the space you occupy equals what? And I was like, and I remember, wrote it down, I studied and looked at that, looked at that, looked at that, and so I asked somebody that I knew was in that class. I said, man, why y'all had that on that board? Time plus space with a negative concept of the space you occupy, and then had an equal sign. He said, what you come up with? It was O.P.O. And I said, I ain't come up with nothing, don't make no sense to me. <laughs> he, so he broke it down, he said, time plus space, that's your reality. That's the reality that you're in. And if you have a negative concept of the space you occupy, which is me, that equals a type of insanity. And I'm like blown back by that. I didn't even say what you're talking about. But he said, look, insanity ain't just running across I-45 butt naked blindfolded. If you're doing things that's contrary to the benefit and the uplifting of yourself, you acting out of, out of, you know, you're out of sanity. You know? And so, of course, I didn't buy into it right then. You know, I'm a young man, you know, I'm just like everybody else in the joint, but I thought I was sick, you know? You know, I wasn't all over the joint because I was still, you know, I'm a studious individual, you know? But that's how I survived, getting in those little books. There was times that I wouldn't order no commissary, but I would order from Red Sea Press, you know, <laughs> or one of them, that type of joints and bought me some literature, you know, because that's, that's, that's what pulled me, you know? and. Um, I was hell bent on seeing my mother before she died. I said, I'm gonna get out of here. It took me 26 and a half years, but I got out. You know, and so um, I, was, I, was, I was hell bent on that. And I didn't want to be a part of the problem because it resonated within me. You know, I remember my brother would be having political education classes. I remember listening to Lot T. Ben, and I remember listening to Omari and um, T. Shaka and the rest of them. And so all these old heads in the joint, you know, just like I came into it quicker. But man, he's a warrior, you know? Took him a while longer, you know what I'm saying? Because he had that burning fire, you know? So that's where it's at. But right now, today, we got them in the streets. They running around, you know, hearts bigger than this building. But they don't understand. How can you quite understand? When you're 16 and you're 15 years old, you're only two or three years removed from mom. What they talking about, mama? Do this here go together? So then they get in the courtroom and they treat it as though they understand everything. And that's the, that's the dilemma, you know? And when we go to prison, the first thing we have to suppress is our emotions. That's why so many of us come out here and we have problems adjusting because emotionally we pick up where we left off. I got I got that. Uh, yeah, we got one, Jim. Go ahead. I know, right. Go ahead. Look, look. Uh, I'll go ahead. You just took me back, brother. We've been knowing Jeff since when? Shoo! 60 years. Uh, Boy in school. Yeah. Boy in school. 60 years now, yeah. And, 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 uh, oh, man. You just took me back. But it took me back to what we were talking about earlier. As young people, we were in that street. You know, we were juvenile. We were getting in trouble there. We were, but even though I knew the story about Catholic school too, you told me. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was like, damn, what? <laughs> but to take you were talking about how, as young people in the, in the neighborhoods, you know how we're caught up in hurting each other and everything. You know, selling drugs or whatever, shooting each other, or just living in that, you know, that poverty, trying to get somewhere to get. Get nowhere. Can you just kind of elaborate on that a little bit more? That that that, that uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Well, uh, check this out, man. Do you have somebody else? I'm, I'm gonna make this as brief as possible. Right. In the absence of having a proper role model or somebody sitting you down and telling you, Charles, you a Murphy, and Murphy men do it like this here. We educate ourselves. We work hard. We stand by our family. If we give our word to somebody, that's bond. We, we honor that there. In the absence of that stuff, then you got little Boo Boo, little Frankie. Yeah, 
put up, man. This and that, that sounds like a good idea too. Now this is the blind leading the blind. Because we don't know. Because we don't have that real understanding of things. And so once you get into it, because we want to, you want a sense of purpose. We was young, we wanted to know. When you hear a uh, Balagoon story, he told you, wow, young child in them streets, you know? We didn't know. We missed something. And what it is, is the destabilization of our environment, of our neighborhoods, of our families. It ain't just when they start coming out with this um, Section 8 that the brother couldn't be in the house. If you get Section 8, who gonna raise my kids? Who gonna demonstrate to them? You know, what, is, what it means, you know? And so they separate these families. And then in our neighborhoods, you know, you see a lot of everything that you see right now. And so we didn't know, so we was in search of so that confusion. And confusion by any other name is still confusion. You can call it being slick, having courage, I'm banging, or whatever else. You see what I'm saying? Because we really just was trying to survive and not be a burden. Usually, most of us, we weren't trying to be a burden on a mother that was trying to care for us. We wanted to hurry up and step out. Oh, I got this. Don't worry about me. And so we, you know, we was out there trying to survive on limited information. And many, many people right now, you're going to run into the ideas that they conceptualized when they was 12 and 13 years old is still governing. So you got 40 and 50 year old men being governed by 12 and 13 year old boys inside here. You know? And so the thing is, how else can you explain when you meet a, a, a 45 year old man, what's up, you know, you say, what's up, Chris? I know you don't call me that, man. You know that tippy, man. Tippy. You're 45, you still hold on to tippy. That's that little boy thing. And so we have to, people always paying attention to us. And believe me, you right now, it's somebody somewhere waiting for one of us to, 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 to screw up. So he's like, I told you so. Only thing they can say about us, we well, used to do this here. She used to do that. She used to do this. She used to get ass. She used to walk the street. This and that there. Because misery learns company, man. And so, you know, our youngsters, our youth, if any of you ever had an opportunity to read Claude Brown, Man Child in the Promised Land, that book has got to be, what, 45, 50 years old now. But it is so true, it even resonates today. Mm -hmm. It resonates today because it speaks the truth. These, man, look here. Ain't no, ain't no simple answers to these here questions. But the truth of the matter is this here. We work and we slave some time all day and we come home and we want to bust a COVID, we want to sit down, we probably want to take our minds off everything. Kid coming out, what's up? Ain't nothing happening, go to his room. What you mean ain't nothing that's something going on? Been gone all day, talk to him. Find out what's happening. But we didn't have, a lot of us didn't have that. And we was mad. We was mad, you know? I was mad. I'm still mad, shit, you know? When my family broke up and my father drove past me with another woman and some kids in the car, ain't that, it didn't pay me no attention? Shit. Yeah. What's the next question? <laughs> uh, I think that's it. We can, we can get one, yeah. Okay, we got one more zone. We'll take this last question and then we'll have a few closing words and we'll be out of here. We got you. Hmm?
do want to actually do something. Um, again, this is ongoing. Pendleton 2 are in Pendleton, or not in Pendleton, but are in prison. Uh, so this is an ongoing thing. Uh, we have all the literature to sign up for, email list. If you want to write to the governor, write to the prosecutor, all that is there. Um, Little John's passed out even more information. Uh, so if you want to get involved, again, get in contact with people at the table, get in contact with people in here. Um, we can get in, in, in touch with you. You can definitely be part of the campaign in any capacity. Um, if at the very least you just want to share the story, that would be very helpful to just share the story. This was in, this was published. This story of Pinot 2 was published just this week in the Indianapolis Reporter and in the Star. So at the very least, you can share the story, send the article to somebody. That would be great. But more importantly, once you help actually join something with groups of people and get involved, uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, I want to give a thank you to the library itself. Um, we want to give a thank you to the Center of uh, of black literature and culture. Uh, this is a very important space to host these kind of things. Uh, so definitely want to shout them out. Um, other than that, thank you for coming out. Uh, hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you.